Against the War. On behalf of the Right to Heal initiative, I'd like to thank you all for joining us here at the Friends Meeting House in Washington, D.C., and watching online via live stream and following on social media using the hashtag Right to Heal. I'd also like to thank the testifiers who have flown in from Baghdad, Toronto, and all around the U.S., as well as, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, as well as Debbie Churchman and the Friends Meeting House for coordinating this space the Right to Heal Initiative convening organizations, the Federation of Workers Counseling Unions in Iraq, Iraq Veterans Against the War, the Organization for Women's Freedom in Iraq, and the Center for Constitutional Rights. Tonight, we will bear witness as Iraqi civil society leaders and U.S. military veterans testify to the lasting impact of the war and make a case that the U.S. government must be held accountable for the damage it has caused and demand the right to heal. Our live audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions using the mics on either side of the room. And our online audience will also have an opportunity to ask questions via live stream, as well as using the hashtag, again, right to heal on Twitter. Moderating tonight's hearing is Mr. Phil Donahue, former talk show host and executive producer of the anti-war documentary, Body of War. Please welcome me and join Mr. Phil Donahue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. Well let's, well, let's first of all say, God bless the Quakers. Um, we, are, we are in the historic uh, meeting house uh, built, uh, this must be 19th century, and you can feel the whole growth of uh, America and also the spirit of the people who had the courage all these years to stand up and exercise are truly American right. It's called dissent. They've done it, and now you here are following in their footsteps. It's a pleasure for me to be surrounded by people who agree with me. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I've done a lot of uh, appearances before peace groups, and I've met a lot of nice people. I've also spoken to a lot of empty chairs. And that makes me all the more impressed with you, the people who keep on keeping on. Because we know that out there across our nation are millions and millions of people who agree with us. These are the people who don't always get on the evening news. They certainly don't get on the shout shows. You very seldom see anti war protesting, dissenting, anything on Meet the Press or the Sunday shows. But you have not lost your cynicism. You believe there is a chance. You believe also that we've become a warrior nation. We spent two, now spending $2 billion a day on things that go boom. We have no respect for diplomacy. It's almost as though we'd rather win a war than avoid one. So it is your voice that is finally getting through. And it's a shame that it took almost 10,000 American lives, not to mention, and you'll hear about the others as this program continues, to finally America looking up and saying, why are we invading all these countries? We are the patriots. We believe in the Bill of Rights. We don't think you should put a man in a cage for 13, 14 years without a Red Cross, phone calls, no contacts with anybody. We don't think you should waterboard. We believe in the Bill of Rights. Free speech is not a quaint idea for us. We believe in privacy. We don't think the government should be listening in on phone calls. We believe this is fundamental American. What's, what's happened is we've become a nation of law unless we're scared. And the Constitution is being ignored by the people who get in public, beat their chest, and brag about it the most. That's, this is the irony. 
This is the pretense that's now across our heartland. The troops, the troops, the wonderful troops, oh, the great troops. The troops come home and the VA doesn't call them back. We are awash in pretense. We think if we say it, that it's true. Consistent with my instructions now to the panelists, I'm going to move immediately because this is a busy program and we want everybody to have a chance. Fala Alwan is president of the Federation of Workers, Councils, and Unions in Iraq. Here's just a look at, I wish we had more time for all of these people, at the chaos that we have left in the country of Iraq. Hello, everybody here. Since 2005 until now, we were talking about how to, we came here in, in Washington to talk about how to end the occupation and how to stop the war with our colleagues here. Today, more than two years after the withdrawal of the US occupation, but the war is not over yet. People are still dying and suffering from the lasting impacts of the war. The, de the, the depleted uranium are still poisoning our land, our water, our air. So there are more than one provinces in Iraq are infected with the depleted uranium that used in the war since 1991 and the first war of, of Gulf and in, in 2003, the last war uh, and uh, uh, the, the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Let me talk about the situation in Basra. More than three main provinces in Basra, the biggest city uh, in Iraq after the, the capital, Baghdad, and al rumayla and Abu al-Khasib, and the west of Basra. There are too many infected provinces with the depleted uranium, which caused a very high rate of cancer cases there in that, in, in that city. And in addition, the local government, which loyal to the U.S. government and don't want the people to talk against the occupation and against uh, the new regime, they don't talk about the situation and don't treat the victims of that war. In Nasriya, too close to, to Basra, which witnessed two, uh, which witnessed two wars in, in 1991 and in 2003, the same situation. And in Baghdad, and the agrarian state company in Iraq, uh, uh, we have registered more than eight cases in one department which uh, uh, subjected to, to the bomb of the U.S. US uh, forces. In addition, m uh, uh, two schools in, in Al-Shaab, uh, northern quarter in Baghdad, the same situation. In Fallujah, while the, the white phosphorus used during the battle in 2004, there are a very big number of the uh, uh, birth defects there and disorders between the children. Despite this situation, despite the catastrophic situation in Iraq, the new government, busy with how to re-divide the wealth and how to seize the, uh, the resources of the society and how to sp spend mountains of dollars and gold, and uh, 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 this corrupted government supported directly by the U.S. government. The new Iraqi authorities, despite the, uh, despite the tragic situation in Iraq, they want to impose a new legislation which uh, enabled them to be in power and to still in power by controlling the so-called elections and to, to issue a new uh, labor laws to control the workers and prevent, prevent them from expressing their demands and their uh, uh, interests. And keeping the old laws of Saddam which prevent the workers from organizing themselves, from holding strikes, from, uh, from negotiating, from calling for their interests. All 
we can talk about the tragedies day and night. Our society full of the tragedies. We want to focus on only to, the, to these uh, uh, specific issues. And uh, uh, we can continue discussing the, this in, in, in the next, next uh, opportunities. I, um, sorry, I, I have no time. It refers to, to, end, uh, yeah, to end my speech. Thank you very much. Thank Stay you. here a second. <laughs> Uh, you will be back, and there will be chance for you. But just um, unions. That, you're you're president of the Federation of Workers' Councils and Unions in Iraq. Yeah. And you apparently your unions are powerless in a way. Then are they against the power grabs of the so-called establishment in Iraq? I mean, you can't get through to the what we have now in Iraq are oligarchs. Is yeah. that so? I am, as a president, I have been punished by the minister because I am working illegal, without a, a, a legal uh, 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 cover to us and uh, legitimacy. So, um, I, uh, uh, after holding a strike, I have been punished and transferred from my workplace to another, to a very distant place. The, the workers and the activists are subjecting to many uh, 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 punishment and to many procedures uh, uh, by the government. For example, the activists of the oil uh, industries, they subjected more than one, uh, uh, um, subjected to more than one punishment to the leader of the union and to other uh, colleagues in addition in, elec in electricity sector, uh, uh, the headquarters of the union attacked by the police and, and the others. But despite this situation, the workers are organizing themselves and, and calling for their rights and calling for their demands, despite the, uh, the situation of preventing them and uh, imposing the old, old uh, uh, laws of Saddam and old orders which uh, mm -hmm. consider the unions illegal and uh, um, um, punishing the, the activities. Yes. Yes. Is there any sense that the United States power establishment is understanding what you're going through here and uh, appreciating the nature of the consequence of this invasion, occupation? Yeah, um, our colleagues here uh, are supporting us to, to raise our voices and to, to talk uh, overtly uh, 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 with the U.S. government and between the uh, uh, unionists here. So hopeful that these opportunities enable us to, uh, 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 to pay the attention of the uh, U.S. government and to call the U.S. government to stop the supporting of the uh, corrupted government of Iraq. Fala, we'll have you, we'll hear from you again as this program continues. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> the senior staff attorney, senior staff attorney for the Center for Constitutional Rights, another organization doing this radical thing of trying to defend the United States Constitution uh, is Pam Spees, attorney at law, Spees, if you please. Thank you, sir. I'll be able to see it there. Appreciate that. Uh, I don't normally uh, like to read my talks, but we, we, as you can tell, we're on a very short timeline and I have a lot to get through. Uh, but before I, I do that, I want to spend the first 40 seconds of my talk um, addressed to our friends in Iraq. Um, our friends come here and, and do everything they can to communicate with us. And uh, since we'll, we hopefully have folks joining us from Iraq tonight, or they would may, may speak. I think that might be my fault. You think it's by Phil's now I'd learn how to do a mic here. <laughs> so you, you want to play it close. Okay. Me. How's this? Better. All right. Um, Kahia Tayiba Ila Aztakatna Fil Iraq, Shlankum. Yes. Ina Al Harab, Kadkaradet, Alena, and Nataki, Hunasawiya. Mimala Shak Fihi, Ana Atawid Al Hakiki, Anadmar, Wakasair, and Najma, and Al Harab Shai Mustahil. Walakin, Nahnu, Kad Alzana, and Fusina, Bitakik, Aladela. Like a man, like um, Adam Takrar, a Harab Malratan Ukra, a mana and ya um, a salam, Walaman, Walistikra, Firbu al Iraq, Lishab al Iraqi Kulu, Hatayan Had al Iraq, Minjadid, 
Min tilka lukud ashaka. Duntum biavacher. What I just said. What I just said. That was Arabic, huh? Is that Arabic? What I just attempted uh, to say in my stumbly Arabic was that we are, the war brings us here today, and that there is nothing that can compensate for the harm and the damage that this war and these decades have caused, but that we are committing ourselves to do justice, to seek justice, um, and that we wish uh, for peace and stability and security in Iraq for all Iraqis. So if we commit ourselves to justice, what does that mean in such a tragic and absurd situation as this, where, where we're just beginning to learn the scale and magnitude of what this war has wrought? And I say absurd because it is a situation that was brought about and propelled by complete and utter falsehoods and trite cliches, and it drew upon the fear and silence and, yes, the cowardice of too many in this country because they didn't want to appear weak. And you're going to hear tonight from other, other testifiers about the numbers of war dead. You're going to hear about the strong evidence that U.S. weapons with, uh, composed of depleted uranium have contaminated parts of the country and the harm that that is causing and will continue to cause for years and years to come. And you're going to hear about the harm that it is also causing to our U.S. service member population, uh, the birth defects and the cancer rates, and you're going to hear about these tolls. Two quotes came to mind as I considered my comments tonight, and one was uh, I encountered when we were working toward the establishment of the International Criminal Court in the late 90s and early 2000s. One of the quotes we often cited was by Jose Aliyala Lasso, who was the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who said that a person stands a better chance of being tried and judged for killing one human being than for killing 100,000. The other quote that came to mind was by Cornell West, who observed that justice is what love looks like in public. So what should justice look like in this instance? It requires looking long and hard at the humanity and fully absorbing the, if, the suffering of those who have borne the terrible brunt of this war and understanding that in some ways we all share responsibility for it, even those of us who protested against it. And justice must start with assessing and acknowledging the depth of the harm caused by these wrongs, the death the displacement, the complete disordering and deepening fractures of communities, the health crisis of skyrocketing birth defects and cancer, the ongoing harm to children and communities of cluster munitions and other illnesses caused by contaminations from the weapons used to wage this war. In international law, justice requires acknowledging all of this, accepting responsibility, and effecting change so that this cannot and will not happen again. It would require us here in this country, for instance, to bring an end to perpetual war and fix a system that let itself get so easily carried astray. And it requires listening and following the lead of those who've been wronged and determining what steps can bring some sense of justice. It's not something wrongdoers get to decide for themselves. And it should start with complete transparency. It should start with providing information about the weapon systems we used, where they were used, when they were used, what they were made of, unbiased scientific studies to determine the environmental and health effects of these materials, clean it up, get the remediation going and provide the health care needed so desperately. And not least, justice requires an accounting from those individuals who so perverted and twisted the truth and cavalierly drove this country into a war of aggression that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives of Iraqis and treated U.S. service members like cannon fodder. Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, Condoleezza Rice, and George W. Bush. I'm almost there. Remember that as early as 1998, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz were pushing for war with Iraq, and they were looking to establish a more permanent U.S. military presence in the region. That was a key aim of the Project for a New American Century. And we now know that from the earliest days of the Bush administration, almost as soon as he took office, these people were looking for a way into Iraq militarily. They just needed a casus belli, an excuse. And then came 9-11, and all reason was suspended in this country. 11 years and half a million lives gone, three trillion US dollars later, unprecedented cancer rates and levels of birth defects ever in Iraq of a kind no one has seen before. Unprecedented rates of PTSD, T traumatic brain injury, cancers and illnesses among veterans from the same weapons and burn pits, 
22 suicides by U.S. service members a day, a torture program, arbitrary detentions, Guantanamo Bay, drone wars far from any battlefield, and more innocent civilians killed. This is your new American century. Until there is more of a price to be paid by the individuals who would wage a legal war on false premises, this resort will be all, to war will be all too easy. We're not naive. We know justice isn't going to happen on its own. It requires all of us, people who insist on looking and seeing, asking questions, and demanding answers. We have to keep talking about it. We will continue to pursue justice at home, and we will continue to pursue investigations of George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld whenever they travel abroad. And we will continue to insist our international legal human rights bodies ask the questions and demand answers and bear witness to the humanity and human rights crises. But they need us here too. Otherwise, it's like a tree falling in the woods with no mechanism to turn the, the wave into sound and give it meaning. So we will continue to work in solidarity with our partners and friends in Iraq. And tonight is another step toward that path. And we thank you for joining us on it. Ramon Mejia is an IVAW member and director of, uh, and father, husband, even more importantly, and seventh and eighth grade social studies teacher. He served in Iraq, and uh, the experience, among other things, moved him to convert to Islam, and he's now working tirelessly for social justice and to remedy the sins of a nation that he said had a, such a close-up look at when he was serving in the war, or should I say the occupation, Ramon. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his uh, servant and messenger. My name is Ramon Mejia. I was born in Dallas, Texas. Um, in the senior year of my high school, I married my wife, and my daughter was born in February of 2001. Um, having little options or economic options to choose from to in order to provide for my family. I joined the Marine Corps in July of 2001. I was sent to Kuwait with Combat Service Support Battalion 18 in order to prepare for the invasion of Iraq uh, in that March. I was not only a Supply Operations Administrations clerk, I was also a 7-ton driver, a Humvee driver, and a 50 cal gunner. I also became the executive officer of my company's uh, driver. During my time in Iraq, I conducted dozens of resupply missions throughout Iraq. It was on these convoys that I would see the devastation and sadness that had in, uh, this country had endured at the occupation. Dozens of burnout trucks, cars, tanks, countless of buildings showed uh, battle damage, um, and even buildings that were on the verge of collapse. Um, up until that point, when I really hadn't looked at the war any other way than just being there and fighting as, I mean, of what we're taught and what war is, we're desensitized that just think that the enemy is human. Um, it wasn't until I arrived in Baghdad in April of 2003 where I questioned the whole idea of why we were there. Um, I heard the call to prayer of the Adhan uh, just outside of Baghdad one early morning after a firefight had occurred just over the next block thinking that I was going to lose my life um, I heard the Adhan for the morning, and I questioned, and I wanted to find out what was the truth of why we were in Iraq. I wanted to find out, you know, who Muslims were, who Iraqis were, and it was, I had realized that up until that point, I had really never looked at Iraqis. I had always seen them, but I never actually looked at their facial expressions. I had never seen that they were human beings. Um, so from that point forward, my, my war had changed. It was, went from one of just simply going through the motions to one of actually questioning. Um, it wasn't until I came back to, to the States in September 2003 that I kind of just fell back into the mix and kind of forgot of all of the things I had been questioning while I was in Iraq. 
and it wasn't until April of 2004 when I started to suffer seizures. I woke up in the middle, in the back of an ambulance, um, wondering what was going on. I had bit a piece of my tongue off. Um, they had said I had, had seizures, and I continued to have seizures multiple, not even uh, just one a week or two a week. I was having multiple a day. Um, and I started going to have MRIs, CAT scans, EEGs, and they could never tell me what was the reason I was having seizures. And it wasn't just that I was having seizures, but I was only having seizures when I was asleep. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I still deal with. Uh, it's been difficult uh, for me and for my family uh, to not know why is that I have seizures. Um, either way, I was retired out of the military. I was, you know, sent home packing. They gave me some medication, and even then, after they gave me the medication, I didn't know what was wrong with me. So I went back to Dallas. Uh, I started to heavily drink. Uh, in my neighborhood, you know, no one thinks about other than just what their own, just other than themselves. So in my neighborhood, you know, there's gang violence, there's drug sales, and that's who my friends were. My friends were drug dealers and my friends were, were gangsters. So I got mixed up into that, that whole lifestyle again. Um, and it wasn't until I finally questioned um, my uncle helped me. He was a Vietnam veteran and he was able to, to kind of help me out and pull me from the downward spiral of attempting to take my life. And my wife finally pulled, uh, pulled me out of that environment and we moved to Ohio, and that's when I kind of started to question the war. Um, sorry, those questions started to rise up again. Um, and then in the process of me questioning the war and questioning my intent, um, I ended up converting to Islam, and for a moment, um, I found peace. And at this moment, I am at peace, but these are issues that I still have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, there are a lot of things that I want to say. Um, we don't have enough time, and I wish I could express to you how sorry that I am that I, that I, for what happened in Iraq. And I've dedicated my life to make things right. Um, first of all, you don't have to explain your emotional condition to anybody. Uh, this audience especially has a special understanding and empathy for what you've been through. Now let me see if I can't just get a couple of short answers from you. Um, are you clean now? You are, right? Yes. That had to be a mountain to climb for you. And you're changing environment. You are now surrounded by people who will not provide these temptations as it was true before, huh? Yes. And uh, your faith has helped you significantly, true? <laughs> and uh, is there, do you recall a moment in Iraq when, you're, when your brain began to kind of open up and see, you know, and then you ask yourself, why am I here? What are we doing? Uh, um, it's not fair to ask you, to, you know, I'm sure there were many things, but. Um, I think the one thing that really opened me up to try and question was the fact that how can, how can we express that, 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 you know, the Iraqis are enemies, but yet I see children that were so happy and so filled with life, but yet we were taking this, the, of what they had away from them. And, and that's what caused me to, to question the fact that, you know, we're human beings and, and how can we treat each other um, with this kind of, you mm -hmm. know, disingenuous kind of, right. you know, taking away of life. Right. Are you seeing uh, a psychiatrist now, or you have professional attention at all? Um, no. No. Uh huh. Um, yeah. The only way that I'm able to deal with this is to continue to work hard and to fill myself with not only knowledge but also to try and work intimately with any and everybody that that's wanting to to promote. Uh, social consciousness and kind right. of, and I think that's what, what has allowed me to pull through. Like the people here. Yes. And your wife, 
your marriage has remained yes, solid. Yes. She yes. must be some, some kind of woman, huh? Yes. She's kept you going. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, John uh, Terman is the executive director and principal research scientist at MIT's Center for International Studies. Professor, MIT is it? You're the son my mother wanted to have. <laughs> so, uh, so. <clears throat> that's a nice thing, to, nice thing to hear. Um, Hope your mother wasn't too disappointed. <laughs> I'm going to make three points about the effects, the human cost of the war in Iraq, which apply, incidentally, to all wars, which I've written about in a book, The Deaths of Others. Uh, about the fate of civilians in America's wars since the Second World War. The first point is that the United States government and indeed other official institutions, the British government, the UN, the Iraqi government, and others failed to take account of the number of people who were killed how they died, why they died, and the after effects of things like radiation poisoning. This is a violation of what we understand to be the trust that we place in government, that is that they will be accountable to us even in the most severe circumstances of wartime. Oddly enough, I think that government, for other reasons, not just moral reasons, but should want to know how many people are dying in a war and how they died and why they died. You'd think the military would want to know. But they failed to, to undertake those kinds of studies and mechanisms which could tell them that story and therefore tell us that story and make them accountable uh, for the high rates of mortality in Iraq, which by my estimate, others' estimate, runs somewhere between 500, 700,000 people. The second point is that other institutions in American society, uh, most particularly the news media, uh, were complicit in this silence and misinformation. To this day, despite several epidemiological studies done by MIT, Johns Hopkins, uh, University of Washington, and others published in the prestigious medical journals, um, you know, the likes of Anderson Cooper or um, you know, NBC News, or what have you, continually refer to the number of people who died in Iraq at tens of thousands or maybe a hundred thousand. And have failed to, again, understand how and why people died. Not only do they get the numbers wrong, but they also don't want to explain to us what the nature of the killing was and the nature of the after effects once the troops left, the US troops left. I think this is also a lack of accountability which we need to take up as a national debate. And the third point to make is to at least underscore what I take to be the vast indifference of the American public about civilian casualties in foreign wars. 
not the public that's sitting in this room, but a much broader public that um, essentially has wanted to put this away, put it off to the side, uh, and not deal with the horror of this massacre, the horror of the after effects, the horror of the trauma uh, that we've already heard about today. We need to come to an accounting of this, and I think we should make it actually a law of uh, regulation for the military to do what you might call a human cost assessment of every war, every time the US military puts its foot or its drones into another country. Because that's the only way to force them to be accountable and to stir some kind of discussion about what we're doing in these countries. Uh, and I hope that that kind of measure or something similar to it will wake people up uh, to the real human costs of war. Thank you. Hang on one second. <clears throat> well, you mentioned media, and that got my attention. And I'm very good at telling people what they already know. You must know and have recorded, uh, by the way, your book is titled The Deaths of Others, plurals, The Deaths of Others. Every major metropolitan newspaper in this country supported the invasion of Iraq. Every one. Uh, did, I mean, we know we have a corporate media, but doesn't, didn't that shock even you? Well, I'm getting too old to be shocked, so maybe. <laughs> Um, I, think that the, I think that the Bush administration was very successful in intimidating uh, people into believing that opposition was some form of uh, treason, is too strong a word, but that, that's sort of the, the implication. Um, and many wars are popular at the outset, regardless, and then they, the popularity falls off. And, Journalists are just as subject to those kinds of pressures as, as ordinary folks are. Um, I, I do want to note, if it hasn't already been noted, I'm sorry I arrived late because of the weather in Boston. Uh, first of all, I want to give this book to you. And secondly, note that this was one of the few journalists around at that time, I hope you remember, who was raising questions. <laughs> Raising the tough questions at a difficult time to do that after 9-11 and paid a high price for it professionally. And it's your kind of courage that should be the model, uh, I think, for journalism. And I, I also just want to note the passing of Jonathan Schell, who was another great journalistic voice, especially around Vietnam, one of the really, truly outstanding reporters who had concern for, for civilians. So this is for you, sir. I and, accept uh, this. Thank you. And with comments. gratitude. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for your generous uh, comments. Um, Rebecca Lampman is an IVAW uh, member. Rebecca has served twice in Iraq. Uh, she, of course, now I'm not able to find it. Uh, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, and is a retired broadcast journalist. So, where are you, Rebecca? There you are. Um, we've just been talking about media. So here's a young woman who knows something about what's go what happened on the inside of our rah-rah press here. Yes, sir. You're on the air, Rebecca. <laughs> Well, um, I won't be speaking about the Iraqi war. Um, what I'll be speaking about is on December 9th, 2011, I was raped in my barracks by one of the soldiers in my unit. I immediately reported it, went to the ER, got my rape kit done, because we're told time and time again in training that if you report it, the rapist will be brought to justice and the victim will be taken care of. <laughs> so I did that. and. By the time I got back to my unit from the ER, about 85% of my unit already knew that I was raped. 
it went around to everybody. I was getting text messages, phone calls, visits to my room. People were asking me what had happened, who did it. They asked me if it was true. Um, and I didn't know that from there it would get worse. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Uh, I had been trying to work for at least a month. And on January 24th, my first sergeant took me into his office, and he belittled me. He called me an incompetent NCO because of my work performance suffering. And he told me he wasn't sympathetic or empathetic for me, and that I should get up and soldier on because that's what we do. That same day, there was a no-contact order against the guy who raped me. By the way, he was never moved out of the barracks. I had to see him every single day. He broke the no contact order that night, was drunk, and came up to me, to my face, and said that I was a liar and that it never happened. At that time, I had reached a breaking point, and I had suicide ideations that night. I did some self-mutilation and was sent to a behavioral center for a week. When I got back, uh, my company commander sent me to the uh, Army Substance Abuse Program because he believed I had a drinking problem. At the initial entry for that, um, in front of my ASAP counselor, he told me to my face that I could have stopped being raped and that it was my fault that it happened. At that point, I had completely lost all trust in my command. Both my first sergeant and my commander had blindsided me because I thought that they were supposed to be the ones that were going to take care of me. They were supposed to be the ones that I could turn to. Between February and July, I continued to see him every single day. Um, I had gone into every single therapy program that Fort Hood offered. And I would have breakthroughs only to have them completely shattered when I'd go home and see him. He continuously broke the no contact order. He spread rumors about me. People were calling me a whore. People were saying that it was consensual. People were saying this, that, and the other. And I had to hear that every single day. So I, I started drinking every single day, and I isolated myself in my room, and I felt like absolutely no one was there for me. In July, I was finally given an opportunity to go to the VA inpatient program um, for seven weeks for women's trauma. It was there that we had a visit from Secretary Shinseki, and he's the, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary, and he asked me what it's like being a victim on active duty. And I told him every single thing that I was going through, that I had tried for months to get him moved out of the barracks. I went up the chain of command. I went to the ombudsman. I did everything I possibly could to advocate for myself. And I was getting the runaround. People were, were telling me that they were working on it, and paperwork was delayed. They just gave me excuses. And in the meantime, they kept reprimanding me for my emotions and for my actions and for everything. After I talked to Secretary Shinseki, within three days, he was moved out of the barracks after he talked to the general of Fort Hood. Three days. I had tried for eight months. After that, I thought that things were getting better. And then the defense kept pushing off the court martial and kept pushing off. It finally happened March 7th. It was a two-day affair. And I had thought that everything would be over as far as, you know, all the questioning from the CID, from the defense. I was grilled on that stand. And the defense tried ca character assassination. They blamed me for what happened. In closing arguments, the defense even said that I raped him. Well, <laughs> I stand up here to tell you that he was found guilty. He was sentenced to 12 months in jail. He was given a bad, dis bad conduct discharge, loss of rank, and he has to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. I thought that I had justice until I found out that he was paroled in January. He didn't even have to serve the full 12 months he was sentenced to. He's now living in Tennessee free. And what I thought would be the greatest day of my life, now it's like a slap in the face again. Because they not only give sex offenders very light sentences, but they also parole them from them. Well, thank you very much for telling us a very painful story. <laughs> Right. Uh, do you, f you feel you're now on, the, you're never going to get over this, right? Is that what I understand victims to be saying? I'm not a victim anymore, I'm a survivor.
Did you, you continue to have any kind of professional attention at all, courtesy? Yes, um, I, I went to a therapist once a week until I recently got out of the Army a month ago, and the VA has been hounding me to do mental health consults, but with the move and everything, I haven't been able to, so um, I am gonna continue my therapy. Mm -hmm. These, uh, I'm sure these audience members will have a, uh, some questions for you. Uh, we all know that you speak for far too many women. And uh, in far fewer cases, but nevertheless significant, men. And uh, we can only speculate what it like, must be like to get a cold stare from the male power structure after this happens to you. And then to be raped a second time with name calling and uh, marking you as some sort of evil woman. You're a brave, brave person, and thank you very much for sharing that. <laughs> <clears throat> Motion Sava Bisfahani. Been working on that for a long time. <laughs> Environmental toxicologist and uh, toxicologist, and uh, you focus on health impacts of the war, all the crud we left behind. It's in the air, it's in the dirt. Yes. Doctor, if you please. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Donahue. I, I, uh, uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm glad to see all these people interested in what's happening to the people of Iraq. Um, I started looking at uh, effects of bombardments in Iraq um, around 2005 when I started hearing stories about uh, increases in birth defects and cancers in these cities. What we have shown so far is that indeed the Iraqi public um, have been exposed to neurotoxic compounds um, such as lead and mercury. Uh, exposure only to these compounds is enough to bring about such epidemics. And um, we see this sur surfacing in more and more cities uh, in Iraq. I learned about Fallujah uh, in 2004, but I learned about Hoeja just uh, last year. Uh, Hoeja, I'm sure you, know, you, may, you may have heard about it. It's a city that is straight north of Fallujah, and uh, there, is a, there is a military base, a um, vacant military base. It used to be a, uh, a school turned into a military base by the United States Army, uh, which contains lots of um, military waste. Um, uh, and right now, children in that town are coming down with uh, cancers and birth defects as well. We're looking into the reasons of what that, why that might be. But when we talk about Iraq today, we have to remember it's in the context of very similar things happening in countries that the United States has, has attacked. It's a repeat. What happens in Iraq today is a repeat of what happened to Vietnam, Laos, uh, 40 years ago, and what happened to people of Japan 70 years ago. Uh, it is something that um, we have to put it in that context. Um, what I want to tell you now is um, what do we do now? Now that situation is Ira in Iraq is uh, so grave, obviously. People have been displaced. Uh, um, people are refugees in their own countries. Um, I don't know if you've seen the recent documentaries out of Iraq. There are large fields of um, uh, abandoned military vehicles, for example, right outside of Basra. Uh, I was in Iran a few months ago, uh, bordering Basra. I wasn't able to get in, but I heard um, lots of stories. These abandoned sites, these abandoned military vehicles, are the perfect reservoir for toxic material to get into the environment and eventually into the bodies of the people. Uh, Basra is one of the most highly impacted. People are suffering from cancers, birth defects, Dr. Al Sabak, who is my uh, collaborator in Basra Maternity Hospital, uh, told me a story last few times I've talked to him. Uh, he has patients who've had, for example, a couple who've had uh, 19 miscarriages. Uh, and on top of that, uh, the woman is suffering from cancer. So imagine the kind of um, men mental, emotional, uh, physical um, pressure on the population of Iraq. The story I told you about is not an isolated situation. 
Uh, it's happening to many hundreds and thousands of Iraqi people. Uh, this pressure is, um, I'm sure you can, can imagine, how difficult it is to bear this pressure. Very little, if any, work has been done on the mental, mental effects of this war. Uh, while people are dying of cancers, I guess nobody worries about the mental effects. But the truth is that war, uh, which the United States government and a lot of US um, citizens are very eager about, it's a devastating thing. And if we continue to unleash it on different populations, um, it will harm us all. As you heard the stories that veterans just now told you, not only they um, caused harm to others, they are severely harmed themselves. So what to, be, what to do now that we are in this juncture? Well, as a, an environmental toxicologist, I would like to see uh, large-scale uh, environmental testing done in Iraq. There's lots of fields with lots of uh, abandoned vehicles. Those have to be cleaned up. They have to be taken away and put away in a way that they will not harm people anymore. The other thing we have to do, we have to set up registries in hospitals in Iraq, across Iraq, these, these things are coming up. We have to set up registries to get a, a clear account of how many people are getting sick, what are they getting sick with. This is something we can use to find the scope of the devastation and the scope of the damage. And the third thing here we need to do is to get scientists and professionals professionals um, engaged in this issue. There are toxicologists, epidemiologists, all kinds of people who have the tools to help people of Iraq. Um, and we need to put them to work. There are, there are mother and child health uh, advocacy groups. Uh, there are places where we can reach out for, um, for support in order to, to answer to the needs of Iraqi people. Uh, now, a couple more words about when I was in Iran a few months ago, I visited several universities in the south bordering Iraq. And what I did hear from physicians there, and they asked me for help, um, they are seeing increases in birth defects and cancers in the neighboring provinces inside Iran. Now, I don't know if you um, are, are aware of the geography there, but there is lots of um, wind, very heavy winds and very uh, lar large storms that displaces uh, sands and different uh, particles across the border. Scientists there are thinking that it may be that being just next to Basra could have uh, caused this. It's possible that the increase in birth defects and cancers you see in, in the bordering towns of Iran today, it may also have to do with occupation and invasion of Iraq. We keep working, and I thank you for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you much. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Tell, uh, Tell them about um, the pits. The, those are deposits. Tell, um, what are they? Tell well, I, I think the United States, I am, I, as much as I know about the pits, I think that the military waste they dump into these uh, large um, uh, dig out uh, pits and then they burn them. And this is a practice that's been happening um, forever, for a long, long time. This is how they get rid of their, their waste. However, what happens is that when you burn it, it goes right into the air, uh, it gets right into your water when it rains, and it gets right into your uh, fruit, food cro crops, and you eat it. Uh, these toxic compounds, especially uranium, lead, mercury, they can get inside of the, peop the uh, population and expose them from, from inside and cause all kinds of uh, harm. Is there any effort on the part of the United States? To give attention uh, to this, these issues? Well, their attention is elsewhere, creating more wars. <laughs> so. uh, <laughs> but you. no, they, they have not acknowledged it, and they, have, they, have, uh, they are adamant about this having nothing to do with the invasion or the bombings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, Christy Castile is the mother of Joshua Castile and president of the Joshua Castile Foundation. Her, her son was very active uh, in the peace movement. Uh, she lost her son and, in fact, has not long ago lost her husband. So we have here the very powerful voice of a uh, widow, and I ask Mrs. Castile to kindly step forward. 
We'll see if I can get this up high enough. I'm going to read mine too, um, mainly because of the emotional nature of what I'm going to be talking about. In June of 2004, my son, Joshua Castile, at the age of 24, was deployed to Iraq to serve as an interrogator at Abu Ghraib prison just six weeks after the abuse scandal hit the news media. His unit was in Iraq until January of 2005. In May of 2005, he was honorably discharged as a conscientious objector. His first book, Letters from Abu Ghraib, tells of his experience as an interrogator and the interrogation, if you can call it that, that led to the crystallization of conscience leading him to become a conscientious objector. He was interrogating a 22-year-old um, supposed acclaimed jihadist, but they instead ended up talking about things like faith, life, reconciliation, and he realized he'd, uh, for the interrogation at least, lost uh, objectivity. He stopped the interrogation, went and told his superiors that he couldn't go back in, and it was at that point, after a seven-year struggle of, of trying to uh, relate his faith to the idea of violence, that he finally came to a uh, crystallization of conscience and filed for conscientious objection. Joshua lived about a hundred yards from the burn pits and worked near them like everyone else at Abu Ghraib. While very aware of the thick black cloud of smoke that covered the base every day and experiencing symptoms of the congestion, the burning eyes, and nausea at times, he, like most all the other soldiers, labeled their symptoms the Iraqi crud assuming it was more due to the dust than the black smoke. They were also told that by their commanders. After his return from Iraq as a CO, Joshua began working with Iraq Veterans Against the War, Catholic Peace Fellowship, and other peace organizations while he completed a dual master's at the University of Iowa in playwriting and nonfiction. He also set out on a path that led him across the U.S. and overseas, speaking, performing original plays, and writing on issues relating to peace, justice, and nonviolence. He did all of this while dealing with symptoms of PTSD like so many other soldiers, but also with a disease beginning to, to destroy his body, which he had no awareness of. In 2011, just a year after he lost his father to brain cancer, which was non-related uh, and non-hereditary, six years uh, while he was attending the University of Chicago, he began experiencing nighttime fevers, fatigue, and congestion that would not go away. Over a period of one to two months, he visited the VA hospital twice but was sent home with cough medicine and a diagnosis of bronchial infection. No x-rays were taken until his third visit after he experienced coughing so intense that it caused excruciating back pain. Six weeks later, he would experience a vertebrae collapse. He was hospitalized immediately after the third visit and an MRI revealed he had stage four adenocarcinoma cancer of the lung that had spread to his liver, adrenals, spine, and hip. It was a cancer that is very slow growing in the beginning, and had we known he was at risk from the toxins present in Iraq, early detection from the symptoms that were pushed aside would have most likely saved his life. The doctors were quite shocked that he had contracted this cancer, as it was very rare in his demographic not having been a regular smoker, and we were unaware at the time that he had been exposed to any toxins. But when the news got out about his illness, a friend contacted him and asked him if he had been near the burn pits while in Iraq. She had done some research. Then the light bulb went on, and Josh revealed that he had also manned a smaller burn barrel for a couple of weeks prior to leaving. We knew very well 
little about the nature of the burn pits, however, until we started doing our research. What we learned was devastating and seemed almost unconscionable and hard to believe about our country's military, that they were allowing more harm to come to our soldiers on a daily basis than our supposed enemies were inflicting. While every doctor that treated Joshua was shocked at his presence, giving, given his age and medical background, until we told them about the burn pits, most were re still reluctant to speak publicly about the connection because it involved our military and because of the controversial nature of the topic. To make a very long story short, after Joshua's first cutting edge treatment seemed to work and eradicated a good deal of his cancer, the unthinkable happened and his cancer remutated. His choice was to revert to other chemotherapies which held little hope and a good possibility of his going blind, which he declined to continue on with. In June of 2012, Joshua and I went to New York City to take part in a clinical trial of an alternative non-toxic treatment that was showing good results for stage four cancer. But it was not to be. In August, he contracted pancreatitis. His cancer spread rapidly and his battle ended on August 25th, 2012, in New York City. Joshua's dying wishes were that we would do what we could, could to see the burn pits eradicated from use ever again by the U.S. military, and that we would give aid to those who were affected by them and, and the war, which he so reluctantly took part in, especially the Iraqi people. And that's what we hope to do through the Joshua Castile Foundation as well as promote a message of peace, justice, and reconciliation, what he talked about with that young Iraqi in his interrogation. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Castile, you may know that um, in the process of my making this uh, Iraq War documentary, I was moved to, uh, this was the most sanitized war of my lifetime. The president said, you can't take pictures of the coffins, and the mainstream media said, okay. Thousands of homes in this country are dealing with the kind of tragedy that befell you. Catastrophic injuries that turn the whole family upside down, and the American people do not see this. And you're just one of many. You must know that. And you must, in your own work, you must have met some parents similarly situated. Well, to be honest, we've just, I've pretty much just come up out of the pit. It's been a year and a half since my son died. And it, while we've been slowly but surely uh, starting the uh, foundation, I've not had a chance to travel much and meet others. But I have done a lot of reading. And I do know other um, people in Catholic Peace Fellowship, for example, and people in IVAW and other writer friends of his who have written books. Um, and uh, yes, the. The reality is that the burn pits are no different uh, than what we were talking about earlier. They're no different than the Gulf War Syndrome. They're no different than um, Agent Orange. Right. We're going to have an epidemic on our hands. It's just yes. slowly coming because many of the symptoms don't show up until right. later. Uh, will you give me an opportunity to briefly put a shout out to the subject of my film, Thomas Young who's watching, I'm sure, on, um, what do we call it? Live stream. Live stream. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling oh, I you, I, I feel like Rip Van Winkle. <laughs> I, I, um, Claudia and uh, Thomas Young and Claudia, his wife, I'm sure are watching. Thomas is a T4. The bullet severed his spine at, uh, between the shoulder blade. He's paralyzed from the nipples down. 24 years old at the time of the shooting, Sodder City, open truck, rooftop sniper. Uh, and I just, I said, people should see this. And uh, I've nominated myself. 
Thomas, uh, to, to show them uh, what harm really means in harm's way, and you are an example of seeing the reality of these euphemisms we throw around, and how proud your son must be of you. And uh, we're very grateful for your stuff. This wasn't a picnic, it was a stand up in front of people. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, Anar Muhammad is president and co founder of the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq. So, oh, there you are. Okay. It's going to be great. You're bringing them up here. Let me, let me get this down here for you. So, all right, speak right into it there. What we were planning for a night of activism turned out to be very sad for all of us. And I would like to recall the first U.S. war on Iraq in 91 at 2.30 a.m. when those bombs went down and they devastated our reality forever. When a city was looking like this with all the, with all the lights on and telephones that work all the time and I'm not saying the politics, politics were great but Within a few moments, it was all gone. Baghdad was a dark city and a quiet city, and all we could hear were dogs barking in the night. And that was the reality. That was a good description of our reality that we lived since that day until now. After the first US war on Iraq, just like any human beings, you get devastated out of fear. You have no hope. I ran away with my family. I tried to find refuge and would they, was able to reach to Canada. It only took a second US war on Iraq to change my mind. The greatest evils are out there and they're going out to fetch people, whether in Iraq, whether in Vietnam, whether in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there's no running away from it. Can I live my life in peace where I am? I don't think so. That was the day I made the decision. I'm back in Iraq, and we will not surrender to sadness. We will not surrender to subjugation. People will have their say, and it's not only the Iraqi people. It's the good people around the world. We've heard it today from the scientists, from the veterans who don't want to be an instrument of killing anymore. They want to be an instrument of peace. We heard it from the lawyers and also from the activists. We are very proud of all these colleagues and everybody who came here because they care about what happened out there and in my mind, I think they are looking for solutions and answers as to how not to let it happen again. There must be a way. And our friends in the Center for Constitutional Rights are trying to find it for us. And we, the activists on the ground in, in Iraq, we are trying to find a way, and the scientists too. We are here to testify. My testimonial is that I have been in Iraq since 2003, have founded an organization for women, thinking that our problem is only about women's rights. Throughout the years, I met in our shelter where we protect women from violence, I met tens of young women who were bought and sold just like merchandise. They even had a price tag on them. On top of that, half of them had diseases that were accelerated by DU in Iraq. Later on, we found out that. Some of our friends who have been in, in Iraq lately, they gave me a report that this many cases of kidney stones is because of the depleted uranium. Many reports came to us. Since that time, uh, we started to look for the truth, for the reports. On one of our trips to the town of Hawija, which Mojgan was speaking about, 
we were trying to do the outreach for women to just get them rid of the, uh, the Al-Qaeda effects where they have to wear the turbans and all of that. But we looked at the mothers and we found out there's a much bigger problem at hand that there are some mothers who have three or four children who don't have limbs that work, who are totally paralyzed. Some of them have the fingers fused into each other. And all of these children have mental disability. And we thought, let's to look at the listings. In that day, in 2009, we found out that there were 335 disabled children of the same disability in one small town. So when we began to speak to people, they, the numbers began to, began to come out, and it was 600 birth defects in one town. And asking the questions, we found the same birth defects in Hawija, while another kind of birth defects in Fallujah, and a third kind of birth defect in Basra. And that is not the only consequence of the war. The US occupation of Iraq has set a formula of division where one sect, religious sect, is against the other. And if you look at the at CNN right now, you would think it's only the Malaysian flight that has a problem. No, that's not right. 300,000 people have been, have been internally displaced in the last three months in Iraq because they are living in the so-called Sunni Triangle. And this is a name that was made in the White House. We did not know what a Sunni triangle was in Iraq until we, we were educated that we have a triangle that is Sunni. <laughs> the US occupation taught us how to hate each other based on sectarian divide. It taught us, it taught the Iraqis that women are inferior because if you've heard in February that was a Jafari law that was passed that treats young uh, girls very badly, it allows the marriage of an adult man to a nine-year-old female child. This is pedophilia. All the modern world does not accept it. Why should it be passed in Iraq? The government that was blessed by the US occupation has alienated the women of Iraq, the, uh, the ethnicities of Iraq, and the sectarian uh, group that is almost 40% of Iraq. We are here to demand the least that can be done at this point. The birth defects that happened, there needs to be reparation for those families. The areas that have been contaminated, there needs to be cleanup for them. And also, we feel that the nations that are based on militarism need to be changed. And the change... <laughs> And the change can come from places like this. We will not surrender. We will change the world and each of us from their own place, but in solidarity. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for caring. <clears throat>
there were tens of men, of journalists, of activists who wrote against it. The civil society in Iraq will not allow it. And it's, we will not let a government that was blessed by the US government to ruin our lives. We are there, we demonstrated on the streets. I had a debate with the Minister of Justice who drafted the law over the BBC TV Arabic, and he was shaken, and next day their cleric issued a mini fatwa against me. So that is the political situation that we live in Iraq, but still we will not surrender. The Iraqi society is a civilized society, and we will not let the rules of subjugation rule us. Domination will have to end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to need the hand mics for the, for the panelists so that we can hear from them and they don't have to get up and knock everybody down. Uh, so will the sound people please, here, here we go. We have a tech team here that is a fine Swiss watch. Um, now, some of you uh, have already thought of your questions. We want to hear from you. Kindly step to the microphone, and I plead with you again to kindly get to your question, and uh, we're glad you're here. We want to feature as many people as, pro as possible. Just remember there are going to be people behind you who want to speak. Yes, ma'am. Okay, hi, my name is Kathy Boylan. I'm with a pacifist group called the Catholic Worker, long tradition, totally dedicated to abolishing all war, remembering that our founder, Dorothy Day, said, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system called war. War is hell, so why would we send our children to hell? That's what I want to ask. And I brought this little chart up that some Quakers did. This shows us how, how our tax dollars are being spent. 60 cents out of every dollar paid to the federal government goes to war. We've got to change that, and I'm, I'm begging people in this audience, if you're not already a tax resistor, to do that. But here's my question to the lawyer. Uh, hi, Ms. Spies, is it? Hi, Ms. Spies. Uh, we've heard repeatedly that uh, the history of the United States is war crime after war crime after war crime, and we've heard it tonight. Isn't it illegal for, the, for us taxpayers to be paying for war crimes? So not only is it immoral, but it's got to be illegal to be in complicity with war crimes through our money. Thank you. Ms. Spies. Um, well, I was thinking that question was going to go a different direction, but I, um, I think it's a good argument to make. To make. Um, I, you know, I think we... And I think for, for those who choose to resist, that is a good argument. But I think that we have to um, really focus on accountability for those. I, and this is a part of it, for sure. But really trying to get, hold those individuals accountable for making the decision. It's like piercing the corporate veil. It's not just to state action. We, we have a system here that is a, a militaristic system. And, and the dismantling needs to happen. Um, but part of it is, is this individual accountability for those who make those decisions um, and who commit an entire country to, to these courses of action. I could say more, but... Thank, thank you for your so. courtesy. Yes, ma'am. My name is Alice Day. In 2004, my husband and I, Lincoln Day, became very upset by the idea that we were going to war in Iraq and we were associated with the Environmental Film Festival here in Washington, but we had never seen any films on the environmental impact of war. Uh, so we, t we spoke to a professor of filmmaking at American University about our idea about the environmental footprint of war. He said, you have a film, make it. We have made the film. It is called Scarred Lands and Wounded Lives, The Environmental Footprint of War. And at the, as a follow-up of that, I'm trying to be brief because I know that is important, uh, we met a young uh, Iraqi veteran who I'm sure would like to be here himself. He took more than 3,000 films while he was deployed in Iraq. 
of the damage to the land, of the stuff that has been left behind. And uh, he has a film here that's available. Both these films are available on our website. You can see them on the computer. Uh, www.scarredlandsfilm.org. Uh, if you're interested, please see us. We have some cards, but uh, I'm speaking for Michael Fitzpatrick, a veteran of the Iraq War, who has made this film about the impact. Thank you for your witness. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin McCarran. I'm with Veterans for Peace. I have a question for the lady from the Center for Constitutional Rights. Can an Attorney General of the United States who refuses to prosecute those who torture or those who've started an illegal war himself in some legal venue be brought to justice? I'm standing up. Um, In, in, there, are two, there are two areas of international law. One is international criminal law and the other is international human rights law. And as a matter of, um, th these are things that we have raised in international human rights arenas. So the state's failure to uh, respect, protect, and fulfill human rights that we are bound to respect abroad, sure. extraterritorially as well, becomes a human rights violation for the state. I think it makes it more difficult if somebody hasn't been involved in the, I don't want to get too technical, but if someone hasn't been involved in the conspiracy to commit the war and the aiding and abetting of it, it is, it is in international criminal law, which is a criminal, an individual criminal liability, it is much more attenuated. Um, whereas if you're dealing with those who conspired and who helped to make, bring this about, that's a more direct responsibility there, and that's very clear that that's contrary to international law. But as a human rights law matter, it, it is a violation on the part of the state for failing to investigate and prosecute and hold those accountable for those human rights violations. Uh, Phyllis Bennis is here. She a, was a guest on my program during my short, unhappy life at MSNBC. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm proud to say it was one of the last shows, and I'm, I hope that I was part of the reason for that pressure. <laughs> I have two quick questions. The first, a technical one, both for our Iraqi friends. When I was in Iraq in 1999, looking at the impact of sanctions, one of the issues that doctors raised with us consistently was the need for exactly this kind of documentation about the impact of depleted uranium. And I'm just wondering, there was talk at the time of an international fund, an international consortium. I'm just wondering if any of that has happened. My second question perhaps is a little more tricky, which is, if we ask for U.S. government accountability, which is a big struggle, obviously, to achieve for the damage that has been done to Iraq, the best we could hope for would be money from the U.S. going to the Iraqi government, which is in many ways an illegitimate government. What is your view of what our demand should be to our government to make real the need for reparations and compensation and what we owe to the people of Iraq, not to the government. Thank you. Who wants it? <laughs> you want it? Okay, uh, I guess we You'll can never be share. a talk show host if you're going to be this bashful. <laughs> okay. You've got to. <laughs> As for the money spent for a DU report, um, we haven't seen any report in Iraq, and uh, Mozgan knows that somebody went to the uh, to officials in the Ministry of uh, Health in Iraq, and and he just laughed it away. He just swept it away that there is n we cannot talk about it. It's not the time to talk about it, and all of that. So that part has not happened. Mm -hmm. As for the other questions, this is the. Uh Obedience part of our panel here. Yeah. Uh, uh, so regarding to the uh, second part of the question, uh, where to go to the, uh, the money? First of all, let us get this money and then to think how to not to go to the Iraqi corrupted government. I think it is a serious question. Uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to contact the, the families of, of victims directly uh, at least by the consultation with the main uh, testimonies and the main uh, 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 organizations who call for, for these uh, 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 compensations. 
I think we can be like uh, um, uh, 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 to watch how, uh, how to uh, um, uh, uh, how to spend this money and to uh, to control the uh, uh, um, the process of spending this money and uh, or these uh, uh, compensations to the people by uh, contacting uh, uh, contacting uh, other organizations, not only the government. Mm -hmm. All right. No, I would, can I just add sure, one by thing all means. to that, Phil? Um, you know, there are other models for this. Iraq had to pay reparations for the invasion of Kuwait, and it wasn't done directly. It was done. It was administered through a third party. Um, you know, there are other models for this, but the important thing is that the communities that are affected be involved and have some say in in what should happen and. And one could envision a similar type of mechanism where, where the funds could be channeled through it and for the betterment with the involvement of people who are most affected. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm Colleen Raleigh from Minnesota. And I was, uh, when you listed the Yes, yes. When, when you listed the principles responsible for lying into the Iraq war, you listed Condi Rice. I'm a member of an anti-war and anti-torture groups. To our horror, we learned a few weeks ago that Condi Rice is being invited to speak at the University of Minnesota, being paid $150,000 by the Carlson Foundation and the Dean Eric Schwartz of the Humphrey Institute. Our groups have tried to debate and say, you can't do this. This is, you know, she has committed planned and, and uh, ordered torture on top of the line into Iraq. Does anyone on the panel have an idea for what we're, we are trying? The faculty doesn't even know who Condi Rice is. They think she's speaking on how the civil rights struggle that she grew up in in the yeah, 50s and the like 60s, she led in Iraq. She's turning the struggle and saying, I helped bring human rights to Iraq. Okay, so uh, is, does anyone on the panel have an idea for what more we can do? It's April 17th that she's speaking. And we're going to lead a protest, but is there anything else that someone can suggest? Yeah. Yep. Uh, professor. Well, um, Do you want to stand, please? I, I want to make sure the camera's. Uh, my only suggestion is that the, um, it's clear that the institutions involved have made a commitment to doing this, so it's hard to get that reversed in the time you have. But use it as an opportunity to talk about uh, her role in in the war. I mean, sometimes these are kinds of blessings in disguise in the sense that, um, you know, she hasn't made that many public appearances actually since leaving government. And uh, this, is a, this is an excellent opportunity to, uh, to raise the questions particularly of how uh, she was involved in misleading the American public. Uh, you remember she was the one who talked about the, the mushroom cloud and and so on, which was uh, a particularly heinous kind of characterization, uh, knowing what we know now about the uh, intelligence, manipulation of intelligence and so on. So, I mean, you know, I would create something very powerful, very fact-based, powerful indictment, basically, uh, of her as complicit in this Catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, yeah, the, the question also. You can for, raise for, that there. For, Pull that up. You're a tall guy. For, for John, for John t t Turman, uh, I look forward yeah. to, to reading your books. But I want to ask you specifically um, about um, Syria. The, they're, they're the kind of yellow journalism that, that I remember, you know, 11, 12 years ago, but leading up to the Iraq War, I saw similarities in the journalism coverage of the Syria and I was really afraid that we were going to do it again in Syria do, would you agree with that do, do you see the same patterns and if so what what if anything can, can, can be done to hold the media accountable the, the you know the mainstream media accountable well it's a big topic uh, and I'll just be brief and, and make a couple of points one is that I don't think there will be involvement of the kind that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan, although the confrontation now with Russia actually opens the door to a um, 
the administration rethinking its policy in Syria as a way of retaliating against Putin, which I think is quite feasible now. But, but also I want to point out something else about Syria which I think is quite interesting, and that is that the news media, which was almost completely silent about civilian suffering in Iraq, uh, has constantly brought out the issue of human suffering in Syria, which of course is a good thing, but um, I did a quick count of references in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, and uh, in 2012, so I had, hadn't even done it in the last year, in 2012 it was four times the number of references to Syrian civilians as there were to Iraqi civilians during the height of the war in 2006. And I think the reason for that is because we weren't doing the killing in Syria. And it's a very important point to, to, to think about sort of the moral frame in which these conflicts are presented to the American public. Um, and there's a lot more to say about this, which I won't right now, but uh, keep your eye on that. Thank you. I have a live stream question. Um, well, uh, those watching on live stream, stream are free to contact us. We'll be happy to get your uh, question on, time permitting. Today, President Obama said, quote, we left Iraq in its, to its people in a fully sovereign Iraqi state. Can Yamar Muhammad or Fala Alwan respond? Please. <laughs> Not true. When 50% of the population is to be used as tools for breeding and for pleasure, which is the woman, and when 40% of the ethnicity is under siege and attack and bombing, which is the so-called Sunni Triangle, and when there are high... Uh, conflicts now between the Arab and the Kurdish region because of the chaos that was created by this occupation. I wonder what sovereignty means. Sovereignty for whom? I think he's talking about the 275 or 300 something parliamentarians who are living inside the international zone and that's the new name for the green zone. It's not green anymore. It's only the sovereignty for those people, and they have the whole wealth of Iraq. While the people are suffering, and there's a number that was produced by the UN reports, almost 38% of the Iraqi people are living under the poverty line. Sovereignty for whom? I would want to ask him, and I would want to hear the mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. Do I go to the audience? Uh, do, sir. Okay. Yes, uh, Art Laffin uh, from Dorothy Day Catholic Worker and also was with Voices in the Wilderness uh, going to Iraq uh, with medicine and medical supplies uh, back in 1998 uh, to, in violation of our sanctions, so-called sanctions program. Um, I want to just uh, 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 reiterate uh, what Raymond and I know all of us here from the United States feel uh, and express to uh, Fala and uh, to Yanar uh, our deep sorrow, our, our, our apologies, our, our, we ask forgiveness for what the United States has been doing to Iraq for 23 years. It began in 1990 into 1991. Uh, the, the war has not ended as we've heard tonight. Thank you for all of your stories of hope. And uh, uh, I, I was part of a little group that went over the White House fence in a leap of faith in 1990. Uh, Eleven of us tried to turn the White House fountain into a fountain of blood to show that if Mr. Bush Sr. went into Iraq, the Gulf would become a fountain of blood. And, and it was an act of repentance, a plea. And so many people, thank you, uh, IVAW, CCR, 
and all the groups that are present here tonight for all the work that's been done to try to end this, this uh, genocide against the Iraqi people. And I, I just, I just want to say uh, how important it is right now for all of us to continue to not let, to not forget the war making and the suffering that continues to endure for the Iraqi people. Uh, we at the Catholic Worker Vigil every week at the White House and the Pentagon. Mondays, 7 to 8 at the Pentagon. Fridays, noon to 1 at the White House. Please join us. And my question is, what more, what more do you think that activist groups and the peace community can do in the United States to uh, help the Iraqi people at this time? Um, you go ahead. Thank you. I think um, there are a very vast specter of the uh, resistance to the war in the U.S. I think all of them, if they work together, uh, are composing a very strong power to not only to, uh, uh, to support the Iraqi people, rather than to change the uh, uh, the policies, the international policies of U.S. and to even to to stop uh, um, uh, uh, more wars and uh, even to to achieve the demands that we are uh, sitting here to call for for it to to clean up the environment in Iraq and to compensate the victims and to stop supporting the corrupted uh, Iraqi and to accountability of the war, uh, uh, accountability for the war in Iraq. I think this uh, big specter in the U.S. and the big number of uh, activists which are struggling against the war since 2003 until now, I think they can uh, make more and more by uh, uh, collecting their ranks and to, to work together and to issue uh, um, or to, to, uh, to start a new policies and to, to build uh, uh, international strategies for, for this, not only to support the Iraqis, rather than to stop another opportunity of war like that in Syria and Libya and other provinces. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Paul. I, I, I agree. I think our position is popular. We are popular. We're going to have to get used to this. I believe most people agree with most of what is being said here. Our problem is we can't, it's difficult to get them to stand up and say so. Dissent is very difficult in this, I ought to know. We are scolds. We don't, we don't love anything about America. We're always complaining. We don't support the troops on and on and on. And that's how we've been marginalized. But that is changing. And we have, we, you know, we, that's why, you know, we, we don't want to be doom and gloom here. We want to raise our, raise our banners high here because we do have people who will be willing to follow. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, again, what do we do? How do we change things? That was the question asked. Um, I'm afraid I don't agree that a lot of people would agree with us. I think I come from a college town with uh, lots of very young people, uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And in that town, we see so much um, racial events against Arabs, Iranians, people of color. So I do feel that this society is, is potentially deeply racist against people of color, against Arabs specifically, they've been fed this anti-Arab um, uh, anti food. And they, they look at a person who is wearing a kafiyah and they think terrorist. So I think that, um, I, I think that that is the truth, that so much work has gone into it to make this society racist, and it is our job to turn it around. Now, how do we do it? I think we need young people behind us. We need to reach out to young, young people in the United States. We need to have them here. There's few young people here, not enough. And I think that could be done by organizing students on campuses, uh, talking to them, listening to them. Um, lots of young people on, uh, on uh, campuses in the United States are depressed. 
uh, I found out le recently that uh, you know, University of Michigan students are very prone to uh, committing suicide. They are depressed. They are uh, seeking medical help for that. So our young people are not healthy. Um, and this racism is not helping them. We need to reach out to them, somehow get into the campuses, having tables, talking to them, finding out what's going on in their heads. Because only last night, uh, University of Michigan student uh, government uh, voted against a resolution that was basically asking, let us observe human rights and let us uh, divest from companies that harm human rights. Obvious companies that have really committed god-awful human rights violations in Palestine, for example. So we need to reach out to our young people and we need to change this racial um, terribly racist uh, situation that we're facing against Arabs, specifically, and also Iranians and people of color. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Denise Lombard. I'm with U.S. Labor Against the War. And I want to thank each of you on the panel. I was very moved and very inspired to action from what I heard tonight. And I don't want this to end tonight. I, I know the Right to Heal campaign continues. And I want to appeal to and challenge each individual in this room and each individual live streaming to bring your creativity, your ideas, your energy into one of these groups. RightToHeal.org, the Joshua Castile Foundation, we do need to build a coalition and we need to continue this work. Let's not let it end tonight. Everyone figure out how to plug in and let's build this movement. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, my question is a rhetorical one, but if anyone has a thought or answer, I'd love to hear it, is where is, was the church, where were people of faith? If uh, Many of us grew up in the church, but if you spoke out, you were definitely odd person out. And of course, this goes back. I, one of my early memories of watching Mr. Donahue in 1970 or 71 with the Vietnam War, War raging was you said that one of the things that shook you was watching priests bless helicopters. Is that, do I have that right? Is that yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, I, I'd love to hear more about I, that. I, uh, praising the Lord and passing the ammunition are mutually exclusive ideas. <laughs> That's my naive question. Where was the church? Where were people of faith? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, anybody? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Please. Son, um, you know, that was one thing that was uh, definitely at the heart of my son's struggle. Um, and there's so, so many ways my mind is going right now, it's, it's kind of hard to um, determine which way I want to go first. But... Uh, one of the things we talked about, our nation was founded on uh, gaining freedom through violence. And we have labeled that patri patriotism to, and I think, our, I think as a country we are uh, confused between nationalism and patriotism. Is it possible to love your country but but not uh, give to uh, a position that says uh, we're better than your country we have rights to do what we need to do because of uh, our, our own value and I think people are really afraid to speak out uh, we're con if you think about uh, what's across the media during the Iraq war, for example, uh, you know, the majority, and, and again, I, I think it takes great courage for, a, you know, a soldier to go into battle, and I'm not trying to downplay that, um, because especially when they think they're doing the right thing, uh, but to come out and say, Violence is not the way. My son was called a, tre a treasonous uh, sympathizer. 
um, because he chose nonviolence. And I think, again, it goes back to being uh, confused as to what does it mean to honor your country, but also uh, honor life in general. Your son received a Catholic Peace Award, did he not? Yes. Or was that you? Uh, both of us. Um, he received the Bishop Dingman Award from Catholic Peace Ministries in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, for his work in peace and justice. And he received that the year he was sick. And then the Catholic Peace Fellowship uh, awarded the St. Marcellus Award to both Joshua and I. Mm -hmm. And that was posthumously after he passed away. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, that it, it's a great, one of the, uh, his great passions was to see uh, the church stand up and take a position. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to stop there. It can just, this is a question about humanity, caring, valuing each other as yes. people. Hi, uh, my question is for Dr. Mojgan and Ms. Spies. Uh, Dr. Mojgan, in, in the research that you mentioned, you said that you found high levels of lead and mercury in people from Fallujah and Basra, and, which comes from uh, not the more controversial weapon systems like depleted uranium and such, but conventional munitions. And you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but this seems to have huge implications that most of the weapons in use by the US military are inherently indiscriminate. So my question for the both of you is, uh, what do we need to do to make sure that the, envi the environmental contamination that we brought to Iraq is not brought upon anyone else? Do we target specific weapon systems to be taken out of use, or is there maybe a, a, a broader approach that we need to take? Um, I'm glad you asked that. And by the way, this is Ross Caputi, who founded Justice for Fallujah. Um, he's got a great story. I, I recommend that you, you check out his work. Um, Ross, you know, really bore witness to some of the weapons that were being used in Fallujah, and it, and it changed um, his course. And he um, has been doing a lot to bring attention and raise awareness and try to get, well, before you know, before the latest situation in Fallujah was really trying to get needed attention to what was going on there. Um, I, I, it's a tough question. I, and what I want to say also is that, um, you know, we have to be mindful that the, that the 91 in, uh, war followed the Iran-Iraq war and, uh, you know, that the U.S. will often use that. But what we, it, to, to, to distance itself from any responsibility for the consequences of the use of depleted uranium. But what we've seen in other places where depleted uranium weapon can, weapons containing DU have been used, like uh, there, were, there were bombings and bombardments in Serbia. Um, you're seeing the same types of cancer rates and birth defects there. Um, and, it's, and it's years later and there's not as much attention to it, or even less attention than there is to what's happening in Iraq. Um, and Fallujah is one of those places that Saddam did not bombard, the U.S. bombarded, and you're seeing these enormous uh, jumps. Um, I, you, Ross asked about indiscriminate weapons, and the, the humanitarian law um, prohibits weapons that have an indiscriminate, uh, that can't, where you can't dis distinguish between civilian and military objectives, and they affect civilians. Um, you know, that's a hard, that's hard for me to answer that question. Of course, there are people out there in the international uh, humanitarian law field talking about treaties that would require environmental assessments and try to contain the environmental harm when war, um, it, of war. Um, but I think that, you know, the bigger question is what are we doing? <laughs> and why, are, why is war, um, you know, an extension, an instrument of foreign policy and such an easy recourse uh, when you have all of these? So understanding the damage, understanding how civilians are harmed um, in the long term is, is key, I think, to answering some of those questions. Yes, please. I actually just want to add something. Uh, the past couple of months, um, some of us worked on an article addressing um, the, the immense um, strength of military research on U.S. campuses. 
um, here, right here in, in uh, D.C., Johns Hopkins is the largest recipient of uh, military research money. They have labs that are totally closed uh, and totally secret. Secret. Nobody knows what kind of research they're doing. Uh, the idea is that a lot of this nation's wealth, the money that needs to go into public health research and research that would help um, make a healthier population mentally and physically is going into universities that uh, hand in glove work with the military. That's the truth of it. Now, how do we break in and uh, make it different? I think that student organizations on U US campuses are able to protest uh, research and development that um, impacts human uh, rights and human health. Uh, I think we have millions of students on various campuses in the United States that we need to be talking to and getting them engaged in discussions about human rights, environmental health, human health, and join all of these concepts and start um, acting from within organizations that really help uh, military um, research and military development. Um, you would be amazed how many students um, I have spoken to at Michigan who simply don't know what military research is. They ask you, what is that? I mean, I have talked to hundreds of them. So there are a lot of things we can be doing. We can be changing the discussion around uh, these issues. So that's what I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, briefly. briefly. Um, can, please? Please. No, I'm just stepping in and appointing myself as your attorney. And when uh, Moshkan says, how do we break it into these research centers? She <laughs> means very clearly, how do we affect the debate around oh, right. uh, from, from There's a question from Twitter. This is another experience my father never had. From Twitter. The U.S. is sending so much money to Iraq. How can that money go to right the, to heal priorities, as we are discussing here, such as cleanup? Uh, we're sending money to, how do we ensure that it be, do, you want to have a, le, a shot? Uh, I would like to get somebody over here. I want to keep, or make sure you're still with us here. Professor, anything? <laughs> Professor. Uh, I'll make one, one quick point, which is relevant to what was discussed earlier, and I think uh, there have been a number of questions about the legal basis for this or that. Uh, what are the legal tools to stop uh, war, in, a sense, in essence, and, um, or to stop universities' complicity in, in uh, working with the Department of Defense? All those things are good tactics. But at the end of the day, it's about politics. It's about who controls the government, who controls the message, um, who sets policy. That's really how you change things. It's not going to be some magic wand of legal uh, discourse or uh, lawsuits. Um, it's not going to be confronting a university president, although all those things can help change policy. But it's, it really has to do, and it goes to this last question too, uh, how do we change priorities so that money spent on the military excessively is spent on human money, needs? Well, it's politics. It's these people up on Capitol Hill and in the White House that have to be changed. Either that their minds changed or their, um, uh, their presence changed. So. Um, that is really the bottom line of getting something done. And to, to the extent that uh, I know this is a very activist crowd, so I don't have to tell you these things, but as, as you continue your activism um, and you, you draw in others to activism, remember that politics ultimately, um, who gets elected, is ultimately uh, the biggest change agent. Uh, the question about money, how do we know where the money is going since, you know, the states, the U.S. is giving a lot of money to Iraq. Sir, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Um, 
It's an established reality that the government is very corrupt. If the money goes to the Iraqi government, it will just be end up in their pockets. Uh, but there is an, another established reality that there is a civil society that's really conscientious and can monitor the process. We are there, we can monitor it, and we can make sure we have the listings of all the children who are disabled, and we can make sure that it goes to, the, to their parents. But there's another part of the question about, uh, about what can be done other than the money, and it's in connection to Phyllis's question about uh, reparations. Uh, there was a talk in the Human Rights Committee today, and um, I, I, I don't know the names of the governmental buildings there, but there's talk about uh, setting up cancer treatment centers in Iraq. Because in, in Fallujah, in Ramadi, and in Hawija, and in Basra, the cancer rates have skyrocketed. So we said, okay, let's not talk about money, but it's your obligation to put cancer treatment centers for the Iraqis who were affected by the contamination of your own weapons. So there is a possibility that there will be a hearing in the Congress in early July, and they might discuss this issue. So I don't know how democracy works here, but if you can affect, <laughs> if can you, you can affect yeah, that yeah. this gets discussed. Yeah. Sometimes we're not sure. To the veterans on the panel uh, from the live stream audience, do, you, do any of you feel you were lied to about why you were there? Do any of you? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, I can recall an instance where my CEO was speaking to the company uh, while we were still in Kuwait, and he was saying... Um, May I ask you to stand so we can no. see? Uh, my CEO was saying that for us to forget about the politics, to forget about what's going on, that Saddam Hussein had gassed his people and that we were here to stop him from gassing more. I wasn't. A, 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 I didn't know that that happened, and, and you know that that happened earlier. I thought that, that was happening right there and then, that somehow Saddam Hussein was going, was gassing uh, Iraqi citizens. Uh, that's how out of touch I was with reality, in the sense of I didn't know my history, and that's why I decided to be uh, a social studies teacher, and that's why I wanted to be to to study history, was because <laughs> because of not knowing, and that's one thing that um, is, is truth, is that knowledge, uh, knowing is a responsibility. And now that I do know what uh, the reason that we were there for, um, uh, it's my knowing that I try to, to, to make sure that um, I won't not know about anything uh, that goes around here or that, that, that I'm involved in uh, ever again. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was ever going to get to talk again. <laughs> no, um, both of my deployments to Iraq, um, at many points, our commanders and first sergeants and sergeant majors would always tell us that we were heroes to the American people and that only we were less than 1% of people who were, who were brave enough to stand up and fight against the injustices and the, the terrorism and the attacks on 9-11. That was brought up multiple times and brought to the forefront of our thinking. Um, and as a broadcast journalist, um, I never once made a negative story because that was not my job. My job was to put a positive spin on every single thing that I covered. Um, whenever there was an interview from a civilian news source, we had to be there as public affairs to kind of monitor the questions that were asked and to kind of keep it in a specific scope. And if at any time the civilian journalism or journalists would ever go outside that, we would have to immediately end the interview and that was it. So seeing it kind of up front as far as the politics and the media, you know, kind of aspect, um, I, I think I was very much lied to. Um, and I feel like I, as a journalist, you know, was helping with the lying with all the stories that I made. Um, did we do good things in Iraq? Yeah, we did. You know, um, we built, water purification plants, we gave school supplies to kids, you know, we did a lot of good things, but at the same time, it just, it seems like we were brainwashed to just forget about all the bad things 
that were going on. Um, I was just telling her before, I was inside a kind of a protective bubble where I didn't know about all these things that were going on in Iraq. And it wasn't until, you know, after my sexual assault and then getting together with the Right to Heal initiative that I really was able to step back and, and I was shocked at the reality of what went on in Iraq. And, and I was almost kind of, you know, it made me feel like I was extremely naive because I went into the war thinking something completely different and thinking that I was doing something good when in reality, you know, we completely destroyed those people's lives. And I wish that I knew that beforehand because I never would have joined. I never would have went to war because that's not the type of person I am. And, you know, at least now I know that and, and you know, I can never take back, you know, what we did in that country, you know, not myself personally, but us, you know, as a military, I can never take that back. But what I can do is from this day forward to try my best to always be as humane and caring and compassionate to anybody I come across. Hey, uh, I want to thank you all for sharing with us, not just facts and figures, but also like Ramon, you spoke from the heart. And I think that like militarism requires us to not feel, that's like part of it, right? That's like a very big part of it. And just by like, I don't know, opening your heart with us, like allowed us to, to tap into that. And I think sometimes the rhetoric and the politics and all of this like actually gets in the way of us like experiencing our emotions. And if we're not experiencing our emotions, uh, we're not gonna figure it out. You know, we're not gonna figure out the route to take. So I wanna thank you for that um, and, and everyone else. Um, my question is for uh, Yanar and for Fala. Um, uh, maybe you all could speak about what's been happening recently in Fallujah um, with the takeover of Fallujah. Um, what that, if that has looked, what's that looked like to the rest of Iraq um, and what do you think, does, what, does it, what does it mean uh, in terms of like the future of, of the situation now, uh, what's happened recently? Thank you. Uh, the situation in Fallujah now and all the western part of Iraq is a really war, war and uh, worse than the war uh, 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 between Iraq and Iran because the victims, or the daily victims of the war is a very huge number and the, the media didn't talk about the real situation there. Uh, it was uh, in 2012, at the end of 2012, it was a peaceful gathering of the people there to protest against the sectarian policies of al-Maliki. Uh, the answer of the government that uh, that was a, a, a gathering of the terrorists and so they, they need to be arrested and it is uh, uh, full with al-Qaeda and other, uh, uh, other pretext of the government. Uh, during the last, the, the, uh, um, the conflict in Syria, the new group which emerged from Al-Qaeda itself, uh, 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 a big number of them entered the, uh, uh, the border of Iraq and started to attack the Iraqi uh, forces, but in the abroad, in the, uh, in the desert, not inside the cities. That was the pretext of the, of the government to attack the city and to, uh, uh, to bomb arbitrarily the, uh, uh, the houses of the people. Nowadays there are more than 400,000 uh, of the uh, homeless people. They, they, uh, they, they become refugees to, to go to another provinces of Iraq. That is, uh, uh, um, and in general, this is the situation in Fallujah and the western part of Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much for what has been a heartfelt uh, exchange of ideas here. I apologize to those we can't get to. We do have time uh, constraints here. Let us all, once again, say what you already know. We sent millions, untold thousands, of young men and women to die on foreign battlefields for our right to be Americans and speak out and protest and, and uh, stand up to what we think are grave mistakes aloud, out loud, in public. It is a truly American exercise. And if we don't use it now, we're, we've wasted their blood. 
you know, you can have any kind of country you want. We get a Neo Mussolini and he'll tell us what, you know, to shut up and sing, which is what a lot of our leaders now are telling us, especially when we ramp up to war. So everything conspires to war. The, the companies, you know, salute. Uh, media saluted with almost no self-examination. Tim Russert asked uh, uh, John Kerry if he was sorry he voted for the war. And Kerry answered in a word, profoundly. Not that many people in the House or the Senate who voted for this war, including the 77 senators, I, 77 to 23, have publicly acknowledged what they must know in their heart was a grave mistake to led, that led to a massive blunder, the legacies of which live today as evidenced by our testifiers today. I am joined by them in uh, thanking you for your rapt attention. We'll have to do this again. It's been my pleasure to serve as your MC. Thank you very, very much. Again, I'd like to thank the testifiers, our moderator, and everyone who made this evening possible, you all, for coming to bear witness as we demand our right to heal. Uh, our, that demand does not end with this hearing. That demand goes forth through these walls and through these doors as you take that demand with you into the spaces that you work and the spaces that you fight. Thank you again for coming with us. We do have time constraints, so we need everyone to uh, take those conversations outside. I know it, it's hard not to linger, but if you do linger, we will consider you part of the Clean Up crew. So thank you all for coming again. Everyone have a great night.